Hi, good evening, sir. We can start now. I, hello, you there, sir? Yeah. yeah okay for me okay. to start. Yeah, okay, sir. One second, sir. So, thank. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Krishna, and I am from the marketing team of Newbog Diagnostic. Thank you so much for joining us today and take uh, today. He has more than eighteen years of experience. And he is part of uh, Divisha, Divisha Medical Center in Bangalore and also at Manipal Hospital Bangalore. So I will. Hi, I, I hope everyone can hear me. I think the internet is in, uh, unstable. Let the doctor start his presentation. We'll do the introduction towards the end and uh, we'll have Hello, everyone. You are able to hear me? Yes, doctor. Go ahead. Okay. I'm Dr. Vijay K. R. Rao, consultant rheumatologist at the Visha Arthritis and Medical Center, Vasveshwanaga, Bengaluru, and also Manipal Hospitals, Bangalore, Old Airport Road. So I thank Undiagnostics Laboratory in Newburgh for giving me this opportunity to uh, educate fellow Hi. colleagues and friends about importance of autoimmune arthritis. Uh, this topic is uh, very uh, uh, of great interest to me because uh, in the last uh, 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 half a decade practice in India, before that I was in UK for nearly 16 years, I've realized that patients reach late to rheumatologists and this has its own consequence because the outcome of any autoimmune disease greatly varies if diagnosed late. So if early diagnosis and early treatment, they do much better compared to late diagnosis and late treatment. So hence, it's very important that, uh, you know, this topic is projected more and more, more and more friends and colleagues are involved in the care of autoimmune arthritis patients. So today I'll be briefly uh, introducing you to various topics which are very important of great relevance in rheumatology and brief snapshots of you know how to approach uh, such cases so uh, one minute i'm having some difficulty here okay so uh, most important in case of arthritis is to actually take history with respect to these key points number of joints involved. Either it's a single joint, what we call is a monoarthritis, or it's less than four joints, what we call is oligo or posyarthritis, or it's more than four joints, what we call as polyarthritis. Acute versus chronic means if the arthritis symptoms, that is pain, stiffness, and swelling in the joints started suddenly, or it started over a period of time. Then, Proximal versus distal. What I mean by that is, is it smaller joints such as hands and feet or larger joints such as knee, hips, spine or shoulders? Is it symmetrical or not? That is, is it on one side of the body or both sides of the body? Is it inflammatory or not? This is very important almost in all of my patients, which I see about 60 patients a day at both places put together, Manipal and my clinic. Every single patient I go through this inflammatory history. What is that? Do you have pain or stiffness in the later half of night? That is after 2 a.m. or first half of morning. Do you have swelling in the joints? And does it get better with activity? Or does it get worse with rest? And does it get worse or does it get better with what we call as non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or painkillers or anti-inflammatories? So that itself will separate an autoimmune arthritis versus a mechanical arthritis, which is age related. That is the key difference. And back pain, of course, because back pain in a young, which is inflammatory, is totally whole different ball game, which is purely should be managed by a rheumatologist as this is could be what we call a spondyloarthritis or inflammatory spondyloarthritis. And systemic symptoms. So is the patient having any fever any weight loss, loss of appetite, skin rashes, malar rashes, photosensitivity rashes, mouth ulcers, hair loss, 
cough, review of systems. We go through that, you know, bowel disturbance, bladder dysfunction, and so on and so forth. So these questions are very, very important for almost all patients presenting with any symptoms of joint pains. Because at the end of these questions, you will be able to find out which way you categorize these patients and thereby you will understand what test to request. So it has to be a focus history taking and then you will know what examination you have to do. Now, I went through your symptoms of inflammation. So that is basically uh, what I told as early morning stiffness, uh, which is, uh, you know, uh, prolonged in case of inflamed joint or stiffness with rest and stress pain or effusion or joint swelling, which is more with the inflamed joint as opposed to a damaged joint. In a damaged joint, you'll have more of crepitus and you won't have any of these morning stiffness, inactivity stiffness, or even, you know, uh, uh, effusion. You won't have that in a damaged joint. Sometimes you could be having a both of this. There is a known rheumatoid patient can have a damaged joint also, and the inflammation can happen in that. So that, that of course, will be a rheumatologist will be able to separate that out. So uh, moving forward, this slide is quite important in terms of what are the conditions we deal with. So if you look at this, this is a busy slide. Let me take you through that. So somebody presenting with arthritis, you can divide that into two parts. One is an acute one, which is the bottom part that is crystalline or infectious, which says, and either a subacute one or a chronic one. So in terms of timeline, it started suddenly is it two types, crystalline, which is gout. We all know is uric acid deposition, which presents with, you know, red hot swollen big toe. And you can have CPPD, which is calcium pyrophosphate disease. So two conditions are associated with CPPD, that is hemochromatosis, hyperparathyroidism. These are metabolic uh, uh, syndromes, what we call as. Gout, of course, have traditional history, which I'll come to the later slides when I touch on the gout. And then infection starts again, suddenly, which can be bacterial most commonly, or could be TB and rarely fungal or viral. Viral is common again, in case of what we call as uh, viral arthritis, okay? Then if you come to the middle part, that is what we call a subacute arthritis, starting within about six weeks duration or 45 days uh, to three months. And here we have inflammatory versus, you have inflammatory here, uh, which you can uh, you know, categorize into rheumatoid arthritis, which is 70% of the patients I see, and seronegative arthritis, which is traditionally ankylosing spondylitis, psoriatic arthritis, reactive arthritis and IBD related arthritis. So these are the classical four seronegative arthritis. Most commonly patients are labeled as seronegative RA. There's nothing called seronegative RA. If your rheumatoid factor and CCP are normal, they don't, they, they are not classified as rheumatoid. We classify them as undifferentiated arthritis. If you have to call it as seronegative arthritis, then it has to be one of these four. Remember that ankylosing spondylitis, psoriatic, reactive or enteropathic. So connective tissue disorders is a whole bunch on its own. That is lupus, Sjogren's, myopathies, systemic sclerosis. So all these have ANA in them, most of them. SLE has 99% of ANA positivity. And systemic sclerosis more or less will have ANA. Myopathies may or may not have ANA, but there are myositis specific antibodies, which I'm not going to touch upon because it's a whole different rheumatology topic per se. And Sjogren's, of course, most of them have ANA positivity and Rho antibody positivity. Then you have arthritis, which is chronic, more than three months, years together. Common is what we have old age arthritis, that is primary osteoarthritis due to cartilage damage. And secondary arthritis, which is erosive, that is due to a, either a rheumatoid or a seronegative arthritis causing secondary arthritis due to inflammatory chemicals causing cartilage damage. Then you have endocrinopathies, that is acromegaly, hyperparathyroidism, hemochromatosis, which causes again chronic arthritis, but they are predominantly non-erosive ones, okay? So this slide pretty much sums up what arthritis patients could have, right? So uh, what is viral arthritis? 
we all see this in terms of rainy season which is this season and it is seasonal sometimes we see very commonly and sometimes we also see most commonly post viral arthralgia so let's deal with this case so 45 year old female comes to your opd with high fever one month ago fever lasted for 5 days only followed by severe joint pains as you see there is puffy hands and feet and there is spitting edema also subcutaneous edema very severe morning stiffness involving hands feet and shoulders and dengue and chikungunya serology are normal esr crp are above 50 rheumatoid factor is normal this is the most common referral we see uh, from primary care or gps so uh, if you look at the etiology of viral arthritis most commonly it's chikungunya or parvovirus so in chikungunya we have history of travel to endemic area history of febrile illness with severe polyarthritis and most commonly tenosynovitis so the whole of hands and feet are involved and parvovirus are often migratory addit often additive arthralgia and arthritis like flu like illness and with rashes which could be transient others are quite less common that is rubella hepatitis b hepatitis c and hiv okay so if you look at this uh, flow chart and just follow me through this so in case of in a primary care a gp setting they may present in an acute phase within 14 days either with a neuropathic pain severe burning hands and feet so we give them you know amitriptyline gabapentin pregabalin carbamazepine one of these what we call neuroleptics and uh, if without improvement after 14 days they go to the next section which i'll deal in next slide so or they can have a localized or diffuse musculoskeletal pain ms pain so you treat them with paracetamol with quite high doses or a combination of tramadol and their visual analog scale of pain is more than 7 and all of these need physical therapy in some form of other so that is physiotherapy is very much mandatory so um in terms of secondary care when they reach hospital so you see that they've already crossed 15 days up to 3 months so again if they have neuropathic pain you have to switch over to them to antidepressants or anticonvulsants um and arthritis some of these patients progress to frank arthritis they need steroids in form of either intramuscular or you know in terms of intravenous if it is quite severe or oral steroids up to 10 to 20 mg per day uh, tapering dose minimum of 45 days and you can add hydroxychloroquine also i normally stick to 200 mg per day if they fail then they go to chronic phase treatment that is beyond 3 months and in terms of diffuse arthralgia you can use common analgesics weaker opioids nsaids and of course physical therapy continues so beyond 3 months that is when you think of if they have quite severe arthritis or tenosynovitis then you think of adding methotrexate uh, and or in a combination or single uh, with sulfasalazine and uh, which is very refractory use of anti tnf or biologic agents and of course you continue your uh you know pain for the uh paresthesia that is anti convulsants or antidepressants and with plus or minus nsaids or opioids depending on the age group and of course infiltration with corticosteroids intramuscular or intravenous so this is you know the management of viral arthritis these patients will need chikungunya serology test dengue serology test and they would need rheumatoid factor anti ccp test and ana test if it's beyond 3 months i would do rheumatoid factor and anti ccp test now coming to rheumatoid arthritis rheumatoid arthritis is one of the most commonest form of autoimmune arthritis we see in our clinics so let us go through this case 45 year old female presenting with 6 months history of joint pains which is gradual onset involving small joints that is wrist fingers knees feet and shoulders early morning stiffness look at this more than 3 hours and swelling of knuckles knees and wrists are seen on examination to take a relevant negative history there's no systemic symptoms nothing to suggest lupus such as no rashes photosensitivity mouth ulcers or alopecia and we have visible joint swelling that is mcp joints are swollen and knee joints are swollen 
So you order the relevant serology, that is a complete blood count, ESR, CRP, liver function test, renal function test, rheumatoid factor, anti-CCP. And you see here that she is anemic, anemia of chronic inflammation, high ESR and CRP suggesting inflammation. Rheumatoid factor is high, that is above 40 is the cutoff, clinical cutoff for a rheumatologist which is relevant and anti-CCP which is high, above 50. The liver transaminitis, there is nothing, liver tests are normal, creatinine is normal. So this is no-brainer, this is a rheumatoid arthritis. And you see an X-ray, you see there is no erosion as such, but there is periarticular osteopenia here. So you treat with, basically what do you do next? You basically treat with intramuscular steroids. Uh, then you give methotrexate and hydroxychloroquine combination at the start. If the ESRCRP is very high and if patient is wheelchair bound, I will not hesitate to start oral steroids tapering dose as well. So you encourage NSAIDs oral usage, you, you know, depending on the comorbidities. And physiotherapy, you start after a week or two weeks, not when the joint swelling is there as it will cause more pain. You start reviewing the patients monthly up to three months and then three monthly. So adjust the therapy if it is not well controlled. Now contrast this with another case. This is a male patient. Rheumatoid is mostly a female disease. A male having rheumatoid means as it is, it's a high disease. And slightly older, 50 year old male who is actually a smoker. So definitely, you know, worse prognosis. And two years history, a longer history of polyarthritis, wrists, hands, feet, knees and involved morning stiffness and swelling seen and she has got systemic symptoms. She's got weight loss. So that itself again is a bad prognosis. So quite a lot of deformities are there already and swelling of wrists, knees, feet and ankles are there. And again, you request the same blood test, complete blood count, ESR, CRP, anti-CCP, rheumatoid factor, liver function and renal function test. You see the anemia is more severe here and very high ESR and CRP compared to the past case and very high rheumatoid factor anti-CCP, more than three times normal cutoff, which is about 40. So this is a more severe patient. You would mean need an aggressive treatment. So if you get an X-ray and you see that there's a lot of erosions, which you have seen already here, so which is not a good sign. So here you give intramuscular steroids, but you give methotrexate and you start talking about biological agents or targeted synthetic DMARDs, which is, you know, more than what we normally use. So that will control the disease in a much better fashion. I'll come to that in a short while. And you use NSAIDs, SOS and physiotherapy as and when required and monthly review again. Okay. So if you look at biological agents, we have anti-TNF, which is infliximab, which came first in 1998 intravenous, which is rat derived and given in IV drip form, and adilumab, golumab, and sertoluzumab, which is humanized. So all these are subcutaneous injections and etanercept also. Sertoluzumab is not there in India, but others are there. And abatisept is recently withdrawn out of India, so we don't have that. And we have tocilizumab. So we also have rituximab, which is not shown here, which is B cell. This works on the TNF pathway, and this works on the T cell abatisept. Tocilizumab works on the IL-6 receptor. Rituximab works on the B cell. These were the ones which came before 2007. So uh, these have their own side effects such as tuberculosis and if long-term usage infections and so on. So it has to be handled by an expert rheumatologist who knows what they're doing about this. They need to have prior TB screening extensively done and done screening for HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C. But they have excellent results, all of these, and with a lot of biosimilar or bio copies, which have done in India, now manufactured in India, uh, these cost somewhere between 10 to 20,000 per month these days. But those who have wheelchair and stretcher bound patients can be able to be mobilized. So this is something have to be referred if patients are not doing well at an early on stage, okay? Now, what is uh, uh, more recent is this, that is, uh, what we call as jack inhibitors. These are there now for the past three years. These are revolutionized treatments in rheumatoid. So they are Janus kinase inhibitors came in the form of two oral tablets, tofacitinib, which launched 
much earlier, four years ago, and baricitinib, which launched nearly two years ago. Tofacitinib is a JAK1, JAK3 inhibitor, baricitinib, JAK1, JAK2. So uh, both are given as tablets. So no cold storage required, no injections, nothing. Works much better than the biologics. So these days, in the last three years, I'm not using biologics for rheumatoid. Those who fail methotrexate and steroids and hydroxychloroquine at adequate doses beyond three months and are still complaining a lot of joint pains with high ESR, CRP, I put them on one of these agents. They cost somewhere around 20 to 24,000 a month, but excellent results starts working within one week. And this is, you know, the quickest onset of, uh, you know, uh, action, um, you know, anything other than steroids. And they have very less side effects, just few upper respiratory tract infections. Herpes zoster is seen very less common. And uh, we normally give six months to one year post which, you know, you know the patients are in remission. So this is something which has revolutionized and next year it's going to go off patent. So a lot of Indian companies will manufacture generic and the rates will come down to around 5,000 to 10,000 per month. So again, it will change the landscape of rheumatoid arthritis. So moving ahead, these are the guidelines which we Europeans have proposed and we are following so far. So if you make a clinical diagnosis of rheumatoid, start methotrexate with or without steroid and you add leflunomide or sulfasalazine if they're not controlled. If they're in control, then you aim to reduce the dose of tablets. If they're not, then you go to phase two. So phase two mostly is either a JAK inhibitor, which I just showed, or a biologic, which I showed the screen uh, with various options. So if achieved uh, control, then you aim at, you know, reducing the tablet dose reduction. If not, then you think of going to phase three. Phase three again is more of these biologics or uh, JAK inhibitors and you aim at disease control of these uh, patients, okay? So that's about rheumatoid and viral arthritis. Now, moving on, the classical seronegative arthritis, which is seronegative or psoriatic or spondyloarthropathy. They are all classified under one group. So let's give you a case. It's a 32-year-old male, young male, presenting with one-year history of pain and swelling in the joints, He's got right middle finger, left knee, right ankle and lower back with swelling and early morning stiffness. He's got psoriasis, uveitis and inflammatory bowel disease such as ulcerative colitis in the past. You examine him, you have dactylitis which is the whole finger swelling and you have achillis tendinitis, right-sided sacroiliitis on x-ray, left knee and right ankle. That is asymmetrical oligoarticular swelling which is less than four joints involved. And you ask for ESR, CRP, and you ask for rheumatoid factor, anti-CCP, and here you have to ask for HLA B27 also, which should be by PCR technique only, because that is the most sensitive and specific. And of course, you ask for complete blood count, liver function test, and renal function test. You see that the raised ESR and raised CRP suggests inflammation. Rheumatoid factor is usually negative here, and HLA B27 is positive. So in psoriatic, HLA B27 is positive in 50% of cases. In ankylosing spondylitis, in more than 90% of cases. In reactive arthritis, for about 25% of cases. And usually they have poor response to steroids. You give them an intramuscular or oral steroid, it doesn't work well. And they have fantastic response to non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. You give them NSAIDs, any painkillers, and they say, doctor, one day I'm completely magical, I'm very good. That is a hint for any of these unique uh, arthritis, which is more common in males and usually affects lower limbs and asymmetrical. That is one joint there, one joint here and less than four joints. Okay. So as you see picture here, asymmetrical, not common, not both wrists involved, one wrist, one knee, one ankle, one toe. And more than six weeks duration, it comes under the category of spondyloarthropathy. So this picture shows why it is grouped under SPA. So you have undifferentiated, you have ankylosing spondylitis, which is just affecting spine. You have psoriatic arthritis, which affects skin, nails. It affects eyes also, You're calling uveitis. It affects back also, causing spondylitis, and affects peripheral joints, causing rheumatoid-like picture. 
Acute anterior uveitis on its own comes under SPA category if it's HLA B27 positive. And reactive arthritis if it's usually after a genital or a gastro infection, following which you have lower limb arthritis. And IBD associated arthritis, this is ulcerative choroides or Crohn's, comes under the category of spondyloarthritis. And juvenile if it is less than 18 years of age. So all these patients will need, you know, your HLA B27 testing by PCR technique. Very, very important. Remember this, friends. Okay. Then you see here that in this category of seronegative arthritis, you see one knee getting inflamed where suprapatellar pouch is swollen. The other knee is normal. And you see actually tendonitis. This side is normal. This side is swollen. Okay. And here you see in ankylosing spondylitis, loss of lumbar lardosis. And, you know, there is some thoracic kyphosis here. Okay. So it is a male patient again. This is what we use for diagnosis of ankylosing spondylitis or spondyloarthropathy. This is by the Europeans, ASAS group, which is the pioneers in management of ankylosing spondylitis. They have said that in any patient with more than three months of back pain, it is inflammatory. Okay. And less than 45 years of age, you can either do an X-ray or MRI and see inflammatory spondylitis or sacroiliitis on both uh, or unilateral sacroiliac joint, either on X-ray, if X-ray shown, you don't need MRI or an MRI where you see osteitis or bone edema. And, or if this is not there, then you have to do HLA B27. So one of these plus any of these, what we call as spondyloarthropathy features, that is inflammatory back pain, arthritis, enthesitis, uveitis, dactylitis, psoriasis, good response to painkillers, IBD, family history of arthritis, HLA B27 and elevated CRP. So either one of this should be there if it is X-ray or MRI is there or two of this should be there if it is genetic or gene factor is there. So this is something we use for diagnosis. Here you see an X-ray of sacroiliac joint which is showing normal, but MRI if you do, it's showing that bone edema or inflammatory sacroiliitis is there, which is asymmetrical. And similarly on a stir sequence, you see that there is bone edema, which is showing with hyper intensity and showing our light up, lighting up of sacroiliac joint. Okay. So if you look at the extra articular manifestations of ankylosing spondylitis, so you see that extra articular manifestations are there in more than 40% of patients. And in this, if you see, UVITS is seen in more than 51% and 20% of patients will have psoriasis, 20% will have IBD, another 10% will have combination of that. That is why rheumatologist is important to uh, extract history so that uh, unifying management is made for all these patients. The management, you see all of them responds to painkillers, which I told. And if it's a pure spine disease, then nothing works other than anti-TNF agents or biologics, which I said. And if it's rheumatoid-like disease, then you will need sulfur salicine and steroids or you know, combination of methotrexate or leflunamide. Surgery is reserved for very end stages and all through you will need exercise and rehabilitation for these patients. So the same thing is told here uh, in terms of recommendations of that. You try at least two doses of painkillers if not responding, then you have to give biologics to these patients. If more of peripheral joints, rheumatoid like involved, then you can use sulfur salazine uh, at the start and painkillers has to be given along with that. If nothing works, then you have to use anti-TNF or rare, recently what we call as IL-17 inhibitors or sikukinibab is used, okay? Now coming to more of a female disease or lupus. So what exactly is this? Let's go through a case. A 28 year old female with three months of postpartum, she is breastfeeding. She has two months history of fever, sun induced rashes, mouth ulcers, joint pains, and she has polyarthritis, hands, feet, shoulders affected. She has a lot of early morning stiffness and swelling in the joints. You examine and there's synovitis in hands, wrists, and severe hair loss and lymph nodes. Blood cultures are negative, urine cultures are negative or normal and raised inflammatory markers. ANA is done, which shows very high dilution titers. So ANA immunofluorescence by one is to two, two, five, six, zero. 
and ds dna is done in ana profile it shows 3 plus and urine is normal so this is clearly what we are dealing with lupus here so this is the latest criteria what we use called eular acr criteria uh, that is european and american uh, uh, societies who have teamed up to form a classification criteria but it's good enough for diagnosis to keep the items or parameters in here involved so the entry criterion is actually greater than 1 is to uh, 180 1 is to 80 that is greater than or equal to 1 is to 80 so ana by immunofluorescence so ana elisa is not very sensitive so ana elisa is very good screening test but you need ana by immunofluorescence even if elisa is negative because if it's greater than 1 is to 80 titers then you need end point dilution they go on serially diluting the labs anand lab does it and where the dilute where the antibody stops we need that because greater than higher the dilution that means higher the avidity of ana antibody in more strongly it's more indicative of lupus and don't ask for ana profile immediately ask for ana immunofluorescence once ana immunofluorescence is negative or positive ask for ana profile because it will give raw antibody which is important for a patient planning for pregnancy as it is you know predictive of congenital heart block in 1% of cases it will also give you ds dna antibody which is having high specificity and prognostication especially in case of renal lupus and rnp antibodies which is important for lung involvement so ana profile is important in such cases and complement also c3 and c4 as ana is a, as lupus is a complement consuming disease so if ana is greater than 1 in 80 then you have domains such as clinical domains fever scoring 2 leukopenia that is uh, cytopenia scoring scoring 3 low platelet scoring 4 in the context of negative dengue autoimmune hemolysis scoring 4 and neuropsychiatric such as delirium psychosis or seizure scoring higher points then immunology you need you know apla antibodies anti phosphatidipeds such as anti cardiolipin igg or igm anti beta 2 gp igg igg or igm and lupus anticoagulant and uh, scoring 2 and low complement scoring 3 or 4 depending on one or both and ds dna or smith scoring 6 and if you have alopecia or oral ulcers or subacute rashes or discoid rashes or cutaneous lupus then higher score then serocytes such as you know pericardial effusion pleural effusion higher score joint involvement scoring high then proteinuria greater than uh, 0.5 grams per 24 hours that is why urine protein urine routine has to be done earliest sign of kidney disease in lupus is a urine test a simple urine test routine will save these patients and if proteinuria is higher or if there are sediments then they will need renal biopsy so if biopsy showing you know class 3 or class 4 they themselves score 10 so classify as lupus if it's scoring 10 or more so this is what we normally use you know in terms of a lupus diagnosis so keep this in mind in terms of what are the organ systems which could be involved in case of a lupus patient so if this slide summarizes treatment if it's mild lupus just skin involved uh then you can just give glucocorticoids either intramuscular or oral and hydroxychloroquine which both are seen in green here and if it is refractory or you know more systems are involved that has blood or cytopenias are involved or hair involved then you need along with that methotrexate or azathioprine methotrexate is good for joints but azathioprine for other other things and if it is severe involved either kidney or lung or uh, cirrhosis involvement or uh, brain then you needs you know mycophenolate or uh, calcium cal calcineurin inhibitors such as cyclosporine or tacrolimus or cyclophosphamide or rituximab so aim is to actually keep the disease activity zero and just maintain on hydroxychloroquine remember we never stop hcq in patients they given lifelong and there's no toxicity with hcq uh, it is very safe drug with recent all negative publicity about it in covid we never stop it we give annual ophthalmology screening for these patients and they are pretty good and we aim for withdrawing steroids if we cannot do it and patient is flaring then we at least give maintain steroids less than 7.5 mg per day and keep uh, immunosuppressants at a very low dose 
and we also ask patients to use sun protections use vaccinations and regular physical activity no smoking body weight and blood pressure management lipid management and glucose management and if they are anti you know phospholipid positive then they have to be managed with anticoagulants so these patients going for pregnancy need special counseling pregnancy is very safe in lupus do not discourage they have to be seen by rheumatologist and lupus has to be stable in the last 6 months even if they have renal lupus it should be stable in the last 6 months and they can plan pregnancy we don't stop tablets in pregnancy some tablets are safe in pregnancy we continue that such as azathioprine cyclosporin tacrolimus steroids and hcq are safe in pregnancy rest all we cannot give in pregnancy so it has to be managed monthly by rheumatologist and expert obstetrician in a tertiary care setup with an expert neonatology unit in case there is a congenital heart block so please remember that so next coming to more uh, you know common topics which we see such, such as osteoarthritis or what people commonly think as arthritis arthritis in elderly which is age related or mechanical use arthritis here you see there is bowing of legs with asymmetrical swelling of the knee joints uh, slightly swollen but you can make out that this is an elderly patient with loss of muscle bulk and this is a classical knee oa okay if you take an x ray of this patient you see there is loss of joint space with uh, subcord subchondral sclerosis and uh, narrowing as well and with osteophytic changes this is almost also narrowed but this almost needs knee replacement as a surgical referral there is no doubt about it if you see here initial this patient uh, you know would have gone through this x ray which is normal 4 years narrowing by 7 years almost bone on bone touching okay and this is hand osteoarthritis which is you see nodular oa looks like rheumatoid it is not rheumatoid this these patients have negative rheumatoid factor normal esr crp and they have bony nodules they are not soft to touch and they are usually patients say that when they rest they are better but they when they do more hand activities pain comes and loss of loss of uh, muscle muscles in the hand small muscles so these patients no need more of hand physiotherapy hand strengthening wax therapies and sometimes you know what we call as chondroitin glucosamine and hydroxychloroquine help these patients uh, along with some uh, painkillers at uh, sometimes so if you look at what are the diagnostic criteria needed for this they should have persistent knee pain morning stiffness it should not be much and they should have reduced function they should have reduced joint movement with sound and bony enlargement okay so idea is with hip and knee oa you should maintain and improve joint mobility reduce physical disability they should may be able to make uh, do day to day activity on their own you should be able to educate patients how to manage on their own limited joint progression so reduce weight is important and improve health related quality of life hrkol is what is the buzzword and of course support them with analgesics which are harmless to reduce joint pain and stiffness so this is again that's what they have said in non pharmacological or pharmacological patient education referral to physio aerobic and strengthening weight reduction walking gates you know acupuncture or tens and you have to uh, you know support them with oral painkillers or topical with corticosteroid injection i normally do if it's inflamed but i don't do hyaluronate injection as it's not much helpful with end stages and glucosamine chondroitin is quite symptomatic benefit there's no harm in that and weaker opioids may be used such as combination of tramadol and uh, uh, the paracetamol total joint replacement is the ultimate therapy and uh, of course you know you can use arthroscopy for a, uh, as a mid term uh, approach okay so osteoporosis is something we commonly see in all our practices what is important is you elucidate his risk factors for what we call as red flags and what are these so if the patient is older than 65 years old if the patient have, has had any fractures after 50 years of age if a close relative either mother or sisters have had osteoporosis or broken uh, bones such as hip fractures 
if health is fairly poor and they are immobilized because of that such as long standing arthritis if patient smoke or underweight for age if early menopause before 45 years never has had calcium because of lactose intolerance irritable bowel syndrome not able to tolerate dairy not got enough calcium uh, at all or if have continuous more than 2 units of alcohol on several times a week uh, um, and poor vision so at uh, risk for falling and not at all active sedentary lifestyle or having any of these diseases metabolic syndromes metabolic uh, conditions such as hyperparathyroidism or hyperthyroidism chronic lung disease uh, uh, you know leading to reduced mobility or using steroid usage anti cancer drugs in cancer inflammatory bowel disease using immunosuppressants or poor uh, absorption of food chronic liver disease or kidney disease vitamin d deficiency cushing's disease which causes internal steroid production and multiple sclerosis or rheumatoid arthritis where steroids or other immunosuppressants are used or immobility related conditions so these are the risk factors for osteoporosis which we have to take in all our patients if there are any of these treatments such as steroids you know anti thyroid medicines uh, anti cancer medicines anti epileptics and gonadal hormone suppressions and immunosuppressive agents simple preventive steps very important such as early mobilization regular exercise prevent smoking and alcohol consumption to be reduced and get your daily dose of recommended amounts of calcium and vitamin d so i would check calcium and bone profile in these patients such as calcium phosphorus and uh, vitamin d and uh, alkaline phosphatase very important in these patients and be physically active improve your strength and balance hence physiotherapy very very important for these patients uh, you know stair modification and help and very important uh, as i said avoid smoking and excessive alcohol consumption not more than one drink per day for women and two drinks for men and talk to your doctor that is your primary care doctor orthopedics or endocrinologist physicians or rheumatologists so bone density test by a proper dual energy x-ray exoptometry is very important and based on the dexa scan reports we treat so vitamin d calcium recommendation between 50 to 70 years 1200 mg calcium and 400 international units of vitamin d and above 70 same amount of calcium and slightly higher of vitamin d important calcium carbonate versus citrate i think it's important that you know the difference Car- citrate is more easily digestible they don't require stomach acid and may be taken any time and not just after afternoon meal uh, but slightly more expensive calcium carbonate usually after afternoon lunch and needs stomach acids to dissolve often leads to bloating if used beyond uh, uh, 500 mg often taken at, uh, taken at meals as i said so vitamin d you can important is i normally do a vitamin d test if it is less than 30 then i treat with once a week uh, vitamin d supplement 60000 units any brand for 8 weeks followed by monthly once uh, and uh, that is what i may recommend daily dose is very cumbersome remember vitamin d is like a key that unlocks the door and lets the calcium into the body so it's not necessary to consume calcium and vitamin d at the same time so what i meant is you can take a daily maintenance of calcium and vitamin d but uh, if vitamin d is low then higher units of vitamin d of 60000 units per week is recommended at least for 8 weeks and uh, injection vitamin d is not safe for my friends it causes lot of uh, calcium mobilization coming to what do we use for prevention common starting point is alendronate that is uh, uh, fosamax or uh, or ibandronate which is bon viva which is used monthly fosamax is uh, weekly and uh, alendronate with calcium is also available so resedronate is actonil uh, with resedronate with calcium that again is weekly so calcitonin is used only in the context of acute fracture which is a nasal spray beyond given not given beyond 45 days and estrogen therapy is only if premature menopause and they have post menopausal hot flushes not as a treatment and uh, 
hormone therapy is given at that stage parathyroid hormone anybody having with post menopausal hip fracture or spine fracture i normally give them as a daily injection uh, is very good results i give for 18 months followed which i give them denosumab which is a rank ligand inhibitor given as a 6 monthly injection and crms are not used quite frequently due to risk of uh, you know thromboembolism and malignancy same as we see with estrogen or hormone therapy okay so moving on to more topics or last few topics which causes more chronic pain so what is fibromyalgia we all deal with this so let's see this 48 year old woman who present with diffuse muscle pain weakness lot of significant fatigue and uh, she there it's there for more than 3 years with generalized pain and fatigue which is ability to uh, her function has been limited and she has sleep problems due to this pain so she is very tense and anxious when she sees you in the clinic and she has brought a big file three or six four files with full x rays mris blood tests they are all normal multiple times they are all normal and there was she was also given a trial of rheumatoid treatments which did not work she was even treated such as rheumatic fever because aso was was positive with penidior and it did not work she is already on vitamin d in b12 but no improvement most doctor said that you are mad so you are wasting my time so it's all in the mind so she is weeping so here you examine the patient and you see that physical examination there's nothing to find there's diffuse muscle tenderness tenderness with some uh, trigger point tenderness there's objective no muscle weakness no uh, inflamed joints and neurology is normal you do the test complete blood count is normal inflammation is normal and all the biochemistry profile is normal so fibromyalgia you see that these are the trigger points which you see right scalene muscles right levator scapulae muscles left upper trapezius muscle and right lower these are the classical trigger points they usually present and they have quite a bit symptomatology that have pain here pain pain there which you can't find an answer for they have lot of sleep disturbance extremely fatigue uh, they have depression and anxiety and they just cannot cope up with life and memory dysfunction okay and if you see here they have widespread pain these are the classical trigger points and they have aching nagging pain and trigger tenderness and they have quite a bit of what we call as brain fog slowing of information and difficulty speaking concentration short term memory problem disorientation if you take a sleep history they have difficulty falling asleep and also maintaining sleep and they are excessively tired and they have stiffness okay so they have other symptoms with them such as restless leg syndrome irritable bowel syndrome fatigue tmj syndrome myofascial pain syndrome so this is nothing but fibromyalgia mostly it's non pharmacological treatments that works for these patients so uh, they you need to engage them with a pain psychologist who does cognitive behavioral therapy which improves physical function and their ability to cope and it should be done by a trained professional and you have aerobic and strengthening and stretching exercises which releases endorphins and relaxes their mind and body and uh, patient education very important as to telling them this that this is not a bodily problem and it is not that they are imagining and you will help them that is very important if you look at pain medications it important you realize that you should choose an agent which has both effect on sleep and pain which is gabapentin duloxetine pregabalin okay others have either effect on sleep only or very little effect on pain uh, such as amitriptyline and most of these pay, things you have to tell that not to depend on too much and it causes lot of uh, drowsiness last few topics about hyperuricemia myths about when to treat when not to treat so gout is basically urate leading to hyperuricemia either over production or under secretion or excretion one of these manifestations are seen either silent tissue deposition or what we call as gout where a typical red hot swollen inflamed joint in a male or renal manifestations causing renal calculi or you know associated cardiovascular events caused by asymptomatic hyperuricemia so if you look at this picture what it shows is if the uric acid level goes above 8 
you know the incidence rates of gout go about you know up to 32.9 that is per 1000 patient years as opposed to less than 5 uric acid level the incidence rates is 0.8 or uh, per 1000 person years so your uric acid as it starts going 8 and it's about 10 it's very high disease so if it's about 10 even if it's asymptomatic we treat it if it's below 10 then if they should have symptoms such as either an acute uh, gout or a polyarticular gout okay so it can present in either this way asymptomatic hyperuricemia that is elevated blood uric acid level with no clinical gout or acute flare such as inflamed you know big toe joint in between normal periods uh, becoming normal and again gout or the interval between gouty attacks come down and they almost have this in the intermediate attacks and it causes advanced gout with erosions when you see on x ray or uncontrolled hyperuricemia so here what is important is if you are able to aspirate a joint and send for crystal analysis that's the gold standard but if you cannot do it then you need a presumptive diagnosis where you see risk factors such as you know chronic kidney disease uh, using diuretics and uh, you know in terms of metabolic syndrome such as obesity type 2 diabetes uh, hyperlipidemia and uh, you know less physical activity sedentary lifestyle and excessive alcohol so comorbidities family history so these are important in history and pattern of joint involvement sudden attack of joint in one or one or two joints only with normal after one or two weeks and uh, you see either a tophi which is collection of uric acid underneath the skin and you do a serum uric acid measurement usually about 7 or 8 you see that okay so here you see this green thing says how do you manage when they suddenly present you give them intramuscular steroid or oral steroid or nsaids if there's no kidney disease or colchicine again no kidney disease and once they settle down after 2 weeks you measure uric acid and you give them allopurinol so allopurinol you need to titrate them up to 300 to 400 mg and measure uric acid on a monthly basis idea is to keep it below 6 so that the flares is minimized and uh, uh, these days for books start we don't use because of an nejm black box warning where they compared that 10 years history of patients on febux stat died early with all cause of mortality so we don't use it as a first line agent unless patients are allergic to allopurinol probenecid is a third line agent which is a you know uricosuric uh, it prevents uh, you know uh, it it promotes excessive secretion of uric acid so these are what we call as urate lowering therapies anthin oxidase uricosuric and uricolytic other drugs in case of hypertension you can choose to use losartan phenofibrate if there is you know hyperlipidemia or high triglycerides which is also uric acid uricosuric agents and peglotikase is not available in uh, our country asymptomatic uric hyperuricemia that is no symptoms but high uric acid guideline says don't treat don't treat maintain good lifestyle avoid excessive drinking good physical activity very important because there is no uh, studies which shows that lowering the urate uh, you know will not improve any comorbidities you know so uh, important is optimal management of all comorbidities is very important right okay last slide which is actually frozen shoulder so what is this this we commonly see in diabetics where a single joint either this or this in a week or two weeks suddenly became inflamed so both active and passive movements of shoulder is very difficult they are unable to sleep on it and in fact those patients who are not diabetic you check and their hba1c is high so this may be the presenting manifestation usually self limiting but very painful sometimes patients say i have not slept weeks together so what i do generally is i uh, offer them analgesics such as paracetamol plus or minus nsaids or codeine and physiotherapy for 6 weeks joint injection i do earlier on which is intraarticular glenohumeral joint shoulder joint followed by one week later physiotherapy if no response then of course then you will have to refer to orthopedics for mobilization under anesthesia or what we call as mua uh, but usually they respond to corticosteroid injections so friends i stop at this
and I take any questions. I've given you a brief overview of what we commonly see in rheumatology with more highlight and autoimmune conditions. I hope you have taken plenty of take home points. Thank you very much. Uh, I invite uh, Vatsalya, a colleague of mine from Newburg, to ask the questions and moderate the question answer round. Vatsalya? Doctor, yeah. Doctor, we have a few questions. First one no. is uh, treatment of fused spine due to ankylosing spondylitis, osteoporosis, and osteophytes in upper spine shoulders and painful neck stiffness. Right. What would be the suggestion for that? It depends on the patient. See, if it is inflammatory symptoms, then I would treat it with uh, disease modifying anti rheumatic therapy to relieve their symptoms or even biological agents. But once if the spine is already fused, there's very little we can do. I refer to spine surgeons to see if they could do any interventions. But remember, osteoporosis has to be treated with if it is, we do a DEXA scan, and if it is T score is you know, more than minus 2.5 then they need PTH to improve their T-scores. But if the ESR CRP is high, I give them non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, provided their renal function permits, and I use sulfasalazine. If it's not improving, I will not hesitate to use uh, anti-rheumatic drug therapy. Okay, but another question from our audience is, uh... what is, the, uh, one of the audience's uh, wife is suffering from rheumatoid problems. So what would you suggest? One of the audience is suffering from motor. Like wife, one of the audience wife. Okay, I would say that uh, not to worry, based on your symptoms and your blood tests, uh, you know, we could, you know, assess what stage of rheumatoid you are on. Based on that, we could optimize the drug therapy and patients could be in remission within three months. Nothing to worry. Okay. Uh, another question is, uh, you know, this person is not able to sit on the floor and getting up is a little bit difficult. How to deal with it? Well, uh, if it's in an elderly patient, that means that it is to do with uh, osteoarthritis of the knee. If it is very severe, I would say that the sitting on the floor beyond 15 minutes is discouraged. If it is a young patient and that is the problem, that means knee is inflamed and swollen, in which case they have to be tested for an autoimmune arthritis. Okay. Um, uh, he, another question. Uh, he's, uh, this person is facing pain and stiffness what, due to uh, sitting on the desktop for long, longer hours. So is it an indication of rheumatoid uh, problems? Yeah, if, uh, if the pain gets relieved after mobility or exercise, and if there is early morning pain and stiffness, then it's definitely an indication of autoimmune rheumatic problem. Is there a scope for hormonal treatment and uh, anabolic steroids in inflammatory arthritis? No, definitely not. It will not help. It will cause a lot of side effects such as weight gain, and excessive acne, and what we call as uh, severe uh, depression problems and us. And that is not a recommended treatment at all. Are uh, swollen ankles, uh, swollen ankles are very painful. Is that a uh, symptom of uh, rheumatoid arthritis? Swollen ankles on its own cannot be rheumatoid. It could be either due to immobility or varicose veins. If there is what we call as pitting edema, when you press skin and the skin goes down. But if it is morning stiffness and pain in the ankle, which gets better as the day progresses, then that's definitely, it could be a rheumatic problem. Okay. Uh, can uh, gut healing may help in arthritis? Yeah, that's more and more. Uh, there is a gut theory to all the autoimmune disorders now. So taking probiotics and maintaining an active gut, uh, probiotics or uh, prebiotics, uh, where good bacteria are maintained, will reduce the incidence of autoimmunity. So that is certainly uh, more and more research is being looked at. Also, Oral hygiene, you know, gum hygiene uh, uh, will, you know, actually prevent rheumatoid arthritis and develop, prevent autoantibody production. Okay. Uh, another question. What is the role of gluten of modern wheat in arthritis onset? 
so gluten sensitivity on its own doesn't cause autoimmunity but we often see that patients who are gluten sensitive uh, that is in either wheat or bread or uh, any of these gluten products then uh, often they have what we call as polyarthralgia that is joint pains which are not swollen so such patients we actually uh, basically say that avoid uh, uh, gluten and sometimes we actually even uh, you know check for celiac disease where uh, you know you know an endoscopy or colonoscopy is needed and we measure ttg levels uh, so uh, tissue transglutaminase levels that will help in diagnosis of celiac um from the audience from the on the chat window we have mr jitendra kumar who has asked that he is suffering from back pain for last 4 month it uh, specifically comes and goes uh, during early morning hours is there any medicine that you would prescribe yes for that you need to see a rheumatologist at the earliest because we need to check your esr crp hla b27 and also get a x ray at least or if not mri of the spine and pelvis to look at sacroiliac joint and once we make a diagnosis of ankylosing spondylitis you need to be started on therapy sooner than later to prevent what we call as stiffness or fusion of joints uh, ms shashi from uh, the audience has asked a question post menopausal women ca calcium with vitamin d how long should it be given so Uh, one of my professors used to say this as long as you breathe so <laughs> okay until your last breath okay i hope uh, this answer has uh, resolved ms shashi's question uh, dr bharati has asked how long uh, allopurinol should be taken for gout okay so that's a good question so allopurinol i normally give for 6 months and mm -hmm. if there is no attack within the 6 months then i stop it and see but provided patient <laughs> should be doing regular physical activity should be reducing alcohol intake and all those lifestyle changes should be reducing red meat and uh, seafood intake and provided that i stop it at 6 months and assess okay uh, pritosh uh, apparently does not reside in bangalore so he would want to consult since he is suffering from ra and joint pain so what so do you say so we have a video consultation appointment you can share them this number okay 9916770444 okay and ask for a video consultation and uh, my receptionist would slot me in and we could help uh, mr pritosh on uh, Okay, Mr. Mm. Harish has asked, "I am um, ankylosing spondylitis patient diagnosed recently in past two months. Taking SAS, how long should it be taken? And if the tablet is stopped, what will be the effect?" So, uh, Mr. Harish, uh, you can tell them that may mostly uh, SAS I give for at least six months. Following six months, I do the therapy. provided patient should not be using and should not be using if the patient is frequently using painkillers then i'll continue saz see most people think saz is what which works but some patients keep taking saz but still keep taking painkillers if patient is taking saz and needing more painkillers more than 2 to 3 times a week that means saz is not working they should be switching over to what we call as biological agents or anti tnf agents limit the usage of painkillers and prevent them from going to kidney damage and blood pressure heart problems and all those and so on and uh, uh, most commonly if we treat adequately 6 months to 1 year then uh, flare up is limited Now, Mr. K. C. Ram Lingam has uh, would like to ask a question. Sir, good evening, sir. Good evening. I am from uh, I am from Tamil Nadu. I am a GP, sir. So every day we are seeing uh, quite a lot of OA patients. What I will usually do is, I will give a single shot of Dexa and we will prescribe Acyclovir for three to four days. And is it the right way to practice? That is the first thing. And whether injectable steroids has a role in treating OA? 
osteoarthritis third is which nsaid is preferred in treating all these cases okay first question uh, is about uh, uh, injectable dexa uh, injectable steroid right approach. right approach you said in giving what uh, usually uh, giving a, a im injection of uh, a steroid for oi okay. also uh. you are taking you are talking about oi of knee or oh, oi any but uh, it is a kind of practice we are doing in our setup i would generally discourage that sir uh, okay sir. because oa traditionally we are uh, taught that it's a non inflammatory disease okay sir okay steroids might give them very limited benefit it might give okay, them sir. 24 hours only okay sir okay sir i If... try not to use any oral or intramuscular or iv steroid okay sir okay what okay, i would okay. say is you know uh, it is depending on their comorbidities okay. Okay, 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 okay. The yeah. best one is actually naproxen, sir, because it has got very good cardiovascular safety. Even if it is good in good in children, also, sir, naproxen. Yes. So two fifty five. Uh, the children don't have OA anyway. So two fifty uh, 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 yeah. to five hundred mg of naproxen you can give OD or BD dose. Okay, sir. Okay. And yeah. what works is a combination of chondroitin and glucosamine. So such oh, as a giant AS. Okay. Okay. Or uh, uh, pro age or anything like that. Okay, so sir. Okay. So you have to give three months. They will find benefit. Okay, But sir. Okay. If it uh. is a swollen knee joint due to osteoarthritis, you yes. can offer either intraarticular or intramuscular steroid. If it is okay, swollen sir. knee, hmm. there should be fluid in that. Okay, okay, okay. Is there any role for muscle relaxant in it? Sir, muscle relaxants are only tried in India. When I trained sixteen years in the UK, it is not something okay. which were trialed there. So okay, in okay. Opinion, it doesn't work. So there are okay. lots of muscle relaxant combinations, myoreal and other things come. Yes, yes. So I generally don't use it, but I'm okay. not discouraging. If you are in the habit of using, use it. Not a problem. But okay, okay. Uh, if it is not helping, stop it. Okay, sir. Okay, okay. Topical only... insights you can use, sir. Topical okay. insights, topical capsaicin. Okay, uh, sir. Therapy, mm. Uh, mm. knee support such as knee braces. Uh, okay you know all those things help okay sir okay okay it's always quadriceps strengthening exercises yeah yes yeah, yeah. that, that's what we have studied sir and one more question sir to add on this uh, uh, because of covid uh, outbreak we are uh, we are talking about lot about hydroxychloroquine we have uh, pros and cons of uh, hydroxychloroquine a lot of people are encouraging some are discouraging so you are, you, uh, in the context of covid you are talking or uh, autoimmune <laughs> You know, in the context of COVID, is it safe for us to take hydroxychloroquine? No, Because, sir, uh, the jury is uh, out. Okay, so ICMR trial, which was done, is a very short trial, open and uh, open label trial. Okay. So uh, you know, I wouldn't uh, say you know conclusively that it helps. So okay, I sorry. myself, I am not taking it. Because okay, first, safety. I am not, not uh, seeing uh, general patients. I am only seeing arthritis referred. Uh, I am not and, patient, okay, but if you oh. are seeing general patients, okay, sir. If you are uh, COVID uh, warrior, what they say? Yes, so, next month I have a posting. You know, <laughs> it is very safe. All this uh, hmm. myths and uh, you know nonsense about QT interval is all nonsense, sir. Because ah, okay, sir. Uh, using hydroxychloroquine for decades. So, oh yeah, that's what I'm asking, sir. The ideal dose is 400 mg BD dose on okay. one day, followed by. Yes. Uh, okay. One mg twice weekly dose. Twice weekly. One hmm. mg twice weekly is enough. Okay, sir. But during your presentation, you have mentioned that you don't use hydroxychloroquine more than two hundred mg. But that is for autoimmune rheumatic diseases. Oh, oh. Generally, okay, sir. Okay. I don't oh. use more than two hundred mg because oh. cumulative toxicity. Because in our autoimmune disease, we use long term, no, sir. So okay, sir. Okay, okay, okay. Toxicity increases. That's why I keep and also. It causes uh, black pigmentation. I don't know if you have observed. Uh, oh, become black. That is why young okay. girls and all I warn them. Those unmarried okay. and all I tell them you may become black. Oh, okay, 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 sir. Okay, 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 <laughs> okay, sir. Okay. okay, thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Okay. Uh, we have two more questions from the audience. Sure. What are the basic exercise to be done for overall bone and muscle health? so there are two types of exercises one is what we call as stretching exercises stretching exercises of individual muscle group so you will have to contact a physio for that where it actually maintains muscle tone then there is something called strengthening exercises so strengthening exercises actually 
offloads the joint so these are the two basic exercises which the physios will teach joint by joint or you can approach any youtube or uh, uh, you know google images for that and uh, secondly is cardiovascular exercises such as brisk walking jogging or uh, cycling uh, these are minimum 30 minutes duration which releases endorphins which increases the feel good factor or muscle fatigue it relaxes and improves improves self confidence uh last question from bhavna uh post menopausal woman having uh, apparently has a standing duty and uh, has lot of struggle painful leg due to osteoarthritis and none of the medicine has been very effective leg uh, leg is uh, c shaped so what do you suggest long standing you should not do if it is c shaped which means the knee joint is almost almost damaged so i have a stool nearby every 15 minutes you stand 5 10 minutes you sit and if it is get a knee x ray showing severe bone on bone then i would say get a surgery done your life will change uh, the other important sup- uh, support yourself with some safe pain killers like ultraset which is tramadol and paracetamol which you can take it at a night basis and use something called as what we know as uh, knee cap or knee support braces which is the elastic one okay is there uh, any other question that uh, any of the audience would like to ask you can please unmute yourself and ask the question thank you very much i guess uh, that is it and uh, there's no more question from the audience doctor thank you for the very informative uh, webinar that you have provided it, it has been very useful to all of us uh, I, I thank you thank you for diagnostic cdl for giving me this opportunity it is my pleasure look forward for more patient education and physician colleague and my doctor colleague education so that all rheumatic patients are benefited Thank you everybody for attending the webinar. Thank you doctor. Thank you so much.